Welcome to Merkaba Chakras, where we talk Buddhism in the fifth dimension. Welcome to another episode of Merkaba Chakras podcast. Today, we talk to my best friend, Angevon Ahadef, about her journey to awaken her inner strength through the path of recovery from her addiction to drugs. This struggle to live a balanced life without drug addiction is one that many people have overcome and many people have also lost their lives to. The interesting thing about Annie's story of sobriety is that she has two best friends go on the journey of Narcotics Anonymous with her as she pulled herself out of the death of addiction into a healthier way to live and love. Next to Annie, we're also going to bring in Bestie, Denise, who is joining us for this colorful conversation. Annie and Denise, welcome to Merkava Chakras. Hello. Okay, thank you so much for talking to me today, Annie. We've got a lot to unpack. And just just to just to take the audience to kind of the beginnings of your journey to recovery, we're going to go all the way back to eighth grade where I met you. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm actually wearing my home ec eighth grade vest. Yes, you are. <laughs> it barely, it barely fits. <laughs> but anyways, so, you know, so I met you in eighth grade and middle school. And just like any other middle school kids going through adolescence years and kind of troubleshooting the things that kind of come come in our lives as we are growing up through adolescence, um, we eventually moved on and to party together in high school. And we used to go to what they called the Reality Center to meet up and hang out with Denise who will join us in in a little bit, just to get dressed and go dancing. And at the time, you weren't an addict. You just grew up in the program and got used to the facility as a meeting place because your parents were recovered addicts. So what got you into being an addict in the first place? Which drug triggered you? Tell us the story of kind of how this all began for you. Um, well, it isn't necessarily like a drug triggers you to be an addict. An addict is something that you are, you generally you're born as, um, maybe environmental factors have uh, to do with it, but an addict for me, how I define it is that I look to things outside of myself to fill what I call a God-sized hole inside of me. And I look to things like drugs some people do uh, for sex, shopping, gambling, eating. Um, it's anything where instead of trying to find a, a spiritual nature to guide my life and to work on what has caused the hole inside of me, and that's how we become addicted. It's not that um, one drug will hook you, so to speak, or one thing will hook you. It's just that's preference. Um, once I got clean and, and got real in recovery, it was very clear that I didn't just use drugs to fill that hole inside of myself. Um, I used many things um, and, and I had to deal with that and come to terms with that in recovery. Um, and when we used to go down to the reality center, I mean, I had gone down there to begin with um, because I was in search of recovery, although I was forced by outside things to go there. Um, and I was an addict then. I hadn't accepted the full measure of my disease yet. I didn't do that until much later. Um, and so I would tiptoe in and out of recovery. Um, and there were times when, when like you and I would get together and hang out and go dancing and stuff that I was, you know, I had half a toe in, so to speak, but I hadn't really submerged myself into recovery until I was about 24. Right. Now, let me ask you something, because it doesn't it doesn't necessarily happen overnight that you become addicted to drugs and not everybody becomes addicted to drugs. Some people are. Yes. Um, So when you and I were 
partying in high school, like many teenagers do in high school, um, you were you using or just kind of dabbling in some drugs or? Um, well, the thing about addiction is what people on the outside know or think they know what's going on is just the tip of the iceberg. I used heavily through high school. Um, but I would go, th- it's more, it's more like the question is, is, um, were there spurts that I wasn't using? Yes. But there was more often that I was using. Um, when I say I was full on addicted at that point, um, I was an addict, but I wasn't full on addicted to drugs. It wasn't until I got older, um, and deeper into that addiction where I was not only emotionally hooked, that was the first thing to get hooked. Um, but then I was physically hooked where you got, became sick if you didn't use. And that was a whole different level. I shouldn't say this way. I just say it this way, a whole different level of, uh, of addiction for me. And that's when I truly became like a spiritually bankrupt individual. Okay. In so question. Life. So question. So like, like, so when would you start using, um, and what kind of drugs, did, what kind of hard drugs were you, um, kind of playing around with in high school? Well, when, my first, yeah, when would you use? My first use was at 10. And that was because my parents are, are addicts and it was around me. Um, and I grew up with the same, um, I grew up with like this dirty little secret that I couldn't tell anybody that mom and dad uses, right? And plus I'd had some things happen really early in life and I was bit by the dog when I was two and kids were mean and made fun of me and and they reinforce what I was being taught at home and that the outside world is dangerous and I can't, I can't let people in. So from a really, really young age, I learned how to like hold everything real close and to kind of stuff it. And like, and all this stuff was like brewing inside of me and I didn't know how to handle how I felt. And my parents were in their addiction. So they weren't teaching me coping skills and how to use my words and, and how to say, I hurt I want to cry. I'm sad. I'm happy. I didn't know how to communicate that. And so I turned to what was available and what I saw happening in my home. And so I, my first use was at 10. I didn't start using every day after that. It was just a kind of slowly perpetual thing. And then we moved out to Washington shortly after that. And um, my dad got hurt on the job when I was like 12. And he had to take a drug test. And that's actually what forced him into treatment. And treatment made him go to recovery meetings. And that's actually how I found the, re- the reality center was through him. And so I would have to go to meetings with him when I was like 12. So he stopped using. But what I knew was that when I used, I didn't feel that pain. I didn't feel that hurt. I didn't feel that emptiness. And now that he wasn't using, I didn't have a supply source anymore. So I had to find way I had to find ways to get more right and so that's when started leaning on the other kids at school and they introduced me to other things like speed and mess and that kind of stuff and that's when the harder drugs started kicking in um, was about high school age and at first it was just you know hanging out on the weekends you know um And then it was maybe after school and sometimes before school. I generally didn't come to school loaded, though. Um, It was too hard to maintain that front. (laughs) Right, right. Because you you definitely covered it very well. I would call you a high-functioning addict. I was, for sure. (laughs) Yeah, because... I I was on honor system. I was in advanced classes. I graduated with a 3.8 GPA. You wouldn't know I had a drug problem if you didn't know me. Right, right. And, you know, I mean, I know you and I, we we did debate and we did a lot of these honors classes together. And, you know, people think that teenagers who are addicts or who um, dabble in drugs are these low functioning derelicts. But no, this is two pretty girls in a nice suburb, honor student debates, won trophies, everything else. And um, one is obviously an addict and hiding it very well. I, I never even knew. I mean, I, I know we would dabble with a little bit of alcohol, like most teenagers do, maybe a little pot and so forth. But for the most part, really, I really didn't notice that because I don't have any kind of those addiction problems. And, and we didn't do any of that when you were hanging out with me. So, um, you know, we well, would. I, did, I had bouts where I was 
I would be clean for a while. I mean, there was, there was almost 18 months when I was going to treatment that I was clean and, and I would have bouts where I would be clean. And so there was often times that I wasn't using, it hadn't progressed to that, that point yet where it became a matter of obsession and compulsion. And that happened later, but like, that was all the foundation of it. And the thing about addiction is addiction knows no bounds. It knows no color. It knows no creed. It knows no orientation, religion, ethnicity, family values. Doesn't it's, you know, a lot of people associate drug addiction with a derelict under the bridge with a needle hanging out of their arm. And this disease does not discriminate. It it hits people of all classes of life. And the thing is, is that it demands manipulation. The disease demands manipulation. And so you have to become the best chameleon you can be to hide it because otherwise it's going to come to an end if everybody knows. Right. And so a lot of people didn't really know what my life, what was really happening in my life. Right. Right. And I was your best, but one of your best friends in high school. And I didn't even know that you, um, you had a, issue i thought maybe we were just going to reality center which is a center where they have the na meetings and you were going there because your parents you know were in the program and you know which happens a lot of people go into the program because the parents were even if they're not addicts and we would just get all glitzy up like teenagers do and get um dressed up in our our hoochie mama gear to go dancing (laughs) And, uh, and and do our normal our normal thing i mean it was just you know that's a song that kind of comes to mind that, that kind of resembles their dancing days um get a superstar <laughs> that, that is what you are coming yeah. from afar reaching for the stars <laughs> that song. run away with me <laughs> to another place we can rely on each other uh-huh <laughs> from one corner to another uh-huh <laughs> So that's why I'm that a, is a long time ago. Yeah, I, I know, know. I know. that song. <laughs> I know that was from our dancing that was days. A good song. That was yeah. a good song. That was and we were getting when we were stars. going down there at that time. I was, um, I was attending meetings, you know, and then, um, and I was clean for like almost eighteen months, and um, but then I, I met a guy. Oh no! Oh no! Here it goes. You met a guy. Yeah. Yeah. And he decided he didn't want to be clean anymore. And I had not worked on any of that on the inside. I still did not know how to cope with how I felt. And I still had this God sized hole inside of me. And now he became the addiction. He became the drug. And so I followed him out. And then I would come in and out and come in and out and come in and out. And I'd be living a lie. And, you know, I didn't want to tell people that I got loaded because I was embarrassed about it. But I mean, I wanted to be clean. Nobody goes out and gets high and then goes to a Narcotics Anonymous meeting unless you have a desire somewhere in you, you know, but I just, I wasn't ready yet. I hadn't hit my bottom. And so, um, you know, so I would come in and out and there's a lot of times where we would go and we'd hang out, we'd meet up with my friends in recovery, you know, and and I'm living this lie, but I, I didn't really see it as a lie at the time because mm-hmm. I was just doing me, as I would call it. You know, right. Not, now, let me ask I was you never something. honest with myself. Right, right. Let me ask you something because um, you bring up a really, really, really good point. So you were doing the program because you were just kind of checking the box and doing the routine. And it, it worked for a while until all of a sudden a life challenge hits you. And the life challenge brings up unresolved issues and dense issues that you never fully healed from or learned to cope with. So, um, and so that's what it triggered. Well, I mean, it's, it's not even just a life event. And that's what a lot of people think is that, oh, there's something tragic that happened and that makes that person use. And then when they think of that instance, that makes them use. I had a tragic thing happen when I was really, really young and it shaped how I viewed myself and thought about myself. I mean, we're talking, I was two, but how I was treated thereafter shaped how I viewed myself and how I thought of myself. And so then when you fast forward 20 years later, when I would get loaded, I'm not thinking about what happened to me when I was two. What I'm thinking about is I'm worthless. I'm not 
I don't have any value. I'm ugly. Nobody really likes me. I'm this, I'm that. I'm just, you know, because that is what I believed myself to be. And, and it really, honestly, starts from a really young age when we're not taught that we are, you know, a child of God, that we deserve to be happy, that we are perfectly perfect the way that we are. We don't need to be anything but us to be okay in this world. We're not, we're not taught these kinds of things. We look for validation to other people. Well, I wasn't getting that at home. My parents were consumed with their own addiction. And I definitely wasn't getting it from friends at school and on the playgrounds and in the, you know, and that kind of stuff. Plus I was harboring a secret. You know, I couldn't tell anybody what was going on at home. You know, so all these things shaped my really, in a really young way, how I would view myself in the world. And so when I would use as an adult, it was more about, I felt empty. I felt like nothing. I felt like, why am I here? God doesn't even look. Like that's, and you know, when the high would wear off, these feelings would come back. So right. So loaded to keep them at bay. Right. So all those, all those, the, the, all those different elements of your childhood that kind of factor into how you felt about yourself and saw yourself. What, I mean, what is that like social conditioning or like. But that's probably a good way to put it. I mean, it, it really, a lot of it has to do with the fact that, you know, what, what you're taught at home and how you're taught how to process emotion. Um, And we see it today with social media. You know, people have emotions and they hide behind their computer screens. You know, they they don't talk to each other, talk it through. Exactly. And so Mm -hmm. it's it's the same thing. It's just in a different format. Now and today we're addicted to social media versus, you know, for me, it was drugs. Partially too, that's what I was seeing happening at home. So I knew that works, Right. But you Mm -hmm. see people do it with shopping and food and sex. Dopamine. Yeah. It's just, it's all about making yourself feel better. Instant gratification. But what really needed to happen is I needed an entire spiritual overhaul. I needed to like crack it open and look at the good, look at the bad, stop carrying things around that were not mine and own up to what was mine. Right. Right. Now let me. Learning how to love myself. Right. Let me ask you something because you're parents put you into church did that not work on your spiritual overhaul they did not put me into church my aunt tried to send me to church um no it didn't because if you feel like crap i'm going to feel like about myself i'm going to feel like crap about myself in church or at the park or at camp or at home you feel like crap about yourself you feel like crap about yourself this is what had to change first right then inner demons do eventually come out if you look at it like like a a nuclear bomb. It explodes inward and then it vibrates out. And so this way I felt about me, it vibrated in everything in my life. And so the only way I knew how to stop it was to numb it. But what happened when I would numb it is I would also numb joy, love, happiness, friendship. You know, it's, it's an all or nothing kind of thing, you know, and why do some people who grow up in the same crappy background not turn out like I did? That is where is the, the million dollar question. And maybe that's where when science talks about how addiction is hereditary, that it's not just like a socially conditioned thing. That was what that was my go to way to deal with it, where some people that had way more adversity than I do and they're winning Nobel Peace Prizes. <laughs> right. So that's right. where addiction, I think, kind of takes people in a different way. Right, right. You know? And my dad was an addict, my biological dad, my mother, my grandmother. It's in my family gene pool. So that's just where my genes also took me, so to speak. Yeah. But now you want to caveat too that there are people who have that gene pool and they are also not addicts. Yes, there are. There are. I, I would have to say I know. A handful of those people. For the most part, when I know somebody who's, you know, they're an addict, you talk to them and their their whole family was an addict. So is it culture? And so they were raised in the culture of addiction? So it could be some, also... Yeah. I mean, some people can go so far the other way where it's, they saw, like, they lived the, they lived the trauma of that person's addiction in their life and they don't want to be anything like that. 
but I kind of wonder if we were to really unveil everything, there might still be an addiction there. It's just not in maybe a drug addiction form. Right, right. Whatever dopamine trigger uh, works for them. For some people, it's excessively yeah. uh, playing video games, excessively, right. and they, they can't function in life and they can't function and keep their school job, whatever the responsibilities are. And that's their escape mechanism. So for some people, it's, it, it's uncontrollable gambling and that's their, where they get the dopamine. But for you, it was, you were it was drugs. It was drugs because you were yeah. raised in it as a way to address um, issues through escaping through drugs. That's how yeah. your parents ta- taught and, you. And the, the thing people got to understand about addiction is that it's progressive. I mean, as addicts, uh, we're pretty clever. We're pretty smart. And like I said, addiction demands manipulation. And so, you know, addicts, they know how to hide it. They know how to maintain and be functional for a long time. And some people's forms of addiction are more socially acceptable and are not as destructive. So it may take longer for that progression to happen, but it happens. It will happen. And so they could go a long time um, with an addiction that in their life and be very manageable and look like they got it all together and they escaped the addiction boat that's in their genes, you know, sit back and wait, you know, it's progressive. Right. Let's now the, the interesting thing is, so you have two really good friends go through this journey with you um, through high school and beyond. And we're going to get to the part where you met a boy Oh who oh Amen. boy <laughs> <laughs> who is not the reason for your addiction but was a vessel mm-hmm. that carried yeah. your issue through so um until you really recovered so and that was Denise so Denise do you want to get into the picture <laughs> Okay. Hey, Denise. Hi. So this is, this is, um, this is Denise. And so Denise was in the, um, <laughs> that logo. <laughs> so Brian. The, the, Denise was in um, the reality center recovery program. Um, and she has her own story as well. But um, when she was in there, she was already working on a lot of these steps. She was already um, kind of more fully into her 12 steps than and, sticking with it and her husband right now she met through the program in high school as well so Denise didn't really go and party with us and dancing with us but you know she was there and gave us kind of fashion tips and all that kind of stuff um (laughs) but (laughs) but um it was almost you know I think about like Denise like you were after you were active in the program what were your thoughts in watching Annie's addiction run its course um yeah what was your thoughts on that so um really me and Annie became friends because she was the only person my age around so um we instantly had a connection just because of both being young so um but it it tore me apart and it was really hard for me because I wanted to be able to justify to myself that I could do it too. And that it was okay for me. It was, it was really, really hard to watch and um, stay strong in my own recovery. So, you know, Annie never showed me her addict side in high school. Um, she's such a good little liar. Um, (laughs) but, but did you see that side? Well, yeah, but I, I, it's, it's a lot easier for her to hide it from you because you're not an addict. I'm a normie. I'm an addict. So I know, I know, I know all the tricks. So no, it wasn't, it, it wasn't easy for her to hide it from me. Now, did I let her lie to me a lot of times? Yes. Um, Because I just, I knew she wasn't ready yet. Mm -hmm. Wasn't time. She hadn't put the shovel down, so to speak, to stop digging her hole. Right. And so when did you know that she finally hit bottom? Because let's, let's rewind to a couple of major events that happened when she finally hit bottom. So... 
Annie, do you want to fill in like what what, what were the <laughs> from the, what were the some of the major things that happened along the way that when you finally well, hit bottom and you said, okay, I've, I need help. Well, I was actually like truly clean for like seventeen months, I think it was, and I was supposed to go to I was supposed to meet Denise at a big convention, NA convention out at the um, out at the ocean called Clean and Free, and I didn't show. And it's because my boyfriend at the time decided he didn't want to be in the program anymore. And like I said, he became my newest addiction. Even though I was in the program and I was attending meetings and I was clean, I wasn't working the steps and I wasn't working on my relationship with a higher power. So I was still, I was basically the same me with all those feelings I didn't know how to deal with. And then, but with no anesthesia, if you will. And so he kind of became my drug. You know, and so when he left, I went with him and, um, you know, we, we went out, we used and we partied. Um, there's a couple times you were with us, we partied and, and then, uh, yeah, but we, when we part, we, I don't recall ever doing drugs. Yeah. It's some drinking. Like we spoke I don't, pot a couple of times. I don't know if you remember yeah. the big, big margarita bowl full of, full of well, drinks. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Ron was a big hothead in college. All right. Yeah. Now everybody knows. <laughs> but. I mean, we were out, and and I will say this, like, my addiction hadn't progressed yet to that obsessive compulsive state, but it was getting there. Yeah, but I never really saw you do any kind of, like, speed or meth or, like, a hard time. I never touched a hard time. That was a different set of friends. Uh, uh (laughs) Ah. And so. When you weren't uh, hanging with Vaughn, you hang out with the other group. So then, um, him and I split up for almost a year, and, um, and I went, like, off the rails crazy. And I didn't see Denise for like almost 10 months or something. And then, um, and then I, um, came back for a little bit on my own. And then I went back to my ex and it was just this really crazy time in life. I still hadn't worked on anything in me and I was going in and out of the program, in and out of the program. I was using it like a revolving door. And then, you know, after a while, um, you just get kind of embarrassed and you just stop coming back, you know? And so when I went back to my ex and we stayed together for another like five years and we got real deep into our addiction, real deep. And so that's when was it got when, bad. Was, was this when you bought the house? Yeah. So we, okay. We, so we, we bought a house um, and we were towards the end there. Um, like my car had gotten repo. We were both were unemployed. Um, the power got shut off. The water was getting shut off. We were basically squatting in this house. And, um, you know, and I was sick and I was getting dope sick and it was just getting real bad. And we were being forced to have to move. And this is where my parents were like, he's not coming. And his parents were like, she's not coming. Right, and right, so right. I got away from him. And in the moments when I, got away like I couldn't use like I was at my parents house and so I had a couple of like days clean and um uh and had like kind of some moments of reality and some clarity where I realized just how toxic he was for me and how how addicted I was to him and before that I had actually ran into Denise at the bank trying to cash a hot check And I had been lying my ass off to everybody. Oh, I'm clean. I'm just not coming around. And everybody, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. and she said like, okay, well, come hang out with me. And, you know, and it's like, I can't, you know, I couldn't, couldn't like let her see me sweat. So I was like, yeah, sure. Of course. Like, oh shit. And she's like, let's get lunch. Right. And, uh, and I always joke, like, I I look like I needed a couple sandwiches because I was pretty sick. (laughs) And, uh. And instead of taking me to lunch, because that's what a lot of people do when they see an addict in, in suffering from the causes of their addiction, they're, they're, they're sickly, like, oh, I need to feed them, I need to give them money, and what they need, <laughs> they need some hope that they don't have to live like that anymore. And she took me to a meeting of Narcotics Anonymous instead. And then we had lunch. And I sat in the meeting, and I caught that hope that's always present in those meetings. I mean, you can't, I've, I've never been to a bad NA meeting. Like there's some meetings I've gone to be like, wow, I don't want what any of those people have, but what they do have is they've got that 24 hours clean. And that was hoping in of itself. 
And so I caught some of that, you know, and then I got home and I can't use like I normally use and I'm away from the toxic, abusive man and like clarity is starting to happen. And that hope, like, I don't know if, if I hadn't gone to that meeting with her and still had that moment of clarity, if I would have seized the opportunity. Right, like I needed right. That hope, you know what I'm saying? That's why it's so pivotal. Right. Now, so, I, here I was like lowest of lows. I'm unemployable. I owed $84,000. I had uh, warrants for my arrest. I had no driver's license, no car. I'm living at my parents' house, um, which was not the best environment. Right. And, you know, like when you say what all happened, it was like my life had been in the toilet for years and somebody finally flushed. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for flushing. Now, before yeah, we right. talk about the flush flush, um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I remember at the time, because uh, there was there was some times where you, it, everything was going good for you. You had just you had bought the house with your fiance at the time that you guys were very much in love. You were expecting a baby. And um, when I would come and visit, all of a sudden um, your fiance will be doing some illegal activity in the garage, <laughs> making some, um, some drug for his little side hustle. Mm-hmm. Yep. And um, and I would ask, what, what what is that? And you didn't like it. You, I know, I remember you didn't like it, but um, it seemed like you put up with it for whatever reason. And I couldn't understand why you would put up with it uh, because I know that you knew what keep going down that path and keep allowing him to go down that path was um, was going to side rail you in a very bad way. Um, and you you didn't do anything about it and this is th- this is what n- people who aren't addicts or normies like myself who, who don't have a chemical issue to um to drugs really wonder about is like you know where you're going but you don't do anything about it you don't have the courage to stop it so why can you explain that paralyzing state of just letting it take over knowing what likely was going to happen well you know when you say like i didn't like when people would ask it's because you're seeing the truth you're getting a glimpse of the truth and i don't want people to see that because you'll blow my cover right like then i can't keep living this dirty life i'm living and you know and, and there becomes a point where you become hopeless and you're like i know i can't keep living like this but i I don't think I can do it. I don't think I can live any other way. And that's like when they talk about the grip, like when addiction has, when you're, when you're in the grip and it's like, it's got such a strong hold on you that not only now has it taken over your life financially, socially, uh, physically, but it has bankrupt you spiritually. You have no hope left. And you're like, I just don't know any other way. Like I, I can't stop the train. It's like trying to stop a freight train going down the tracks at full speed. You can't stop it. It has to crash, you know? And so you're almost kind of like just waiting for the crash. Right, right. So, um, so you lost, things started to go side rails. Um, no, and you're fully seeing it happening and you just don't have the willpower or, um, the ability because of your addiction to put a stop on it and, you know, put your life back in order and get back onto your responsibilities and all that kind of stuff. Like normal people would do, it, it continued to kind of take over um, your responsibilities and you start making excuses for uh, doing the drugs and carrying on with the, the cover story of making drugs in the garage. <laughs> Um, I'm like, okay, well, this is your journey. I honor and respect your journey. Um, but <laughs> not an uh, honorable journey. <laughs> it's okay. It's part of your journey. It's, it's, it's part of your story. So, um, you lost everything. You mm-hmm. lost the house. You lost everything. the potential marriage. You lost the everything. baby. 
you lost yourself almost. So um, now we go back to the flush. Denise <laughs> came in and flushed the, the crowd <laughs> out. <laughs> flushed her, yeah. That's a horrible legacy. <laughs> I love the flush. I love that flush. Oh. The, thing flush. About, <laughs> flush. the thing about with Denise is that like I tell when I when I share and do a speaker meeting and stuff, I always talk about how, you know, you might not think that you have anything to offer in the program. You know, maybe you're not like a circuit speaker or you're not heading up some committee or whatever. But they don't realize it just staying clean, how much of a service that does for another addict. See, when I went back out and I followed that toxic relationship out into a toxic world and lost myself in it, she didn't follow me. You know, we talk about sponsorship and helping each other out in the program. And it's like it goes to a certain point. Like there's a saying that says that I will walk with or walk through hell with you, but I will not walk through hell for you. And And so the thing is, if, if, if she continued to have a relationship with me, she would have to justify in her own head somewhere at some point that it's okay for me to get loaded, but not her. And for an addict, that's a slippery slope. Like once you start saying that it's okay for that person to get loaded, when you can clearly see their addiction in action, then, then why is it not okay for me? And her self-perseverance had to take over. And I, at the time, I thought, my God, what a selfish bitch. Like, we can't even have be friends just because I don't want to be in Narcotics Anonymous anymore. And I Oh, that's well, a big one. That's a I big one because people don't I understand did. that. People don't they understand don't. that. They're like, well, can't we still, you know, be, be friends? And, and, you know, if we don't do the same, th- can't we still carry on? It's like, well, if you get clean, you don't go and continue to hang out with your dealer. Right. And so, well, and the thing about it is it's, it would be what we call co-signing each other's bullshit. Like she'd be co-signing me ruining my life by saying it's okay for me to you hang out with you when you're, like you said, you know, making drugs in the garage. Like that's not okay. We don't hang out with people who do that. Like you're an addict. It'd be kind of like somebody who has cancer that is curable. Right. And, but they're not going to take their medication, but Hey, you want to go have lunch with me? Like, no, no, I want you to go take your medication. Like you, you have an opportunity to change your life. And if you, if I had to protect myself, right. Like it's not, it's Mm self-perseverance, you know? And so she stayed clean and I didn't was the bottom line. And so when the stars and the sun and the moon and, and God all aligned, right. And she found me in the bank, you know, she could see, she could see that I was at the end of my rope. You know, and she took me to the thing I needed more than money and food and this. I needed hope. And she took me to the meeting. And the reality was, is that it wasn't, she thinks that I took her there to help her. (laughs) The reality was, is that I didn't want to be left alone with her. (laughs) Right. Because I am an addict and I don't know how I'm going to react. I don't know what I'm going to do. Yeah, no, I have help my safe place. Right. So right. she felt like I was taking her to her safe place, but I was really going to my safe place. Oh, okay. So she really think about herself. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's funny. But it's the addict needs, you know, when you are clean, the most important thing, and this is hard for people to understand, the most important thing is your recovery. It's more important than your spouse. It's more important than your children. It's more important than everything. And it's because if I'm not clean, I don't have a spouse. I don't have... I can't be a mother. I can't be a, you know, a daughter. I can't be an employee. I can't be anything if I'm not clean. Right. And so she stayed clean. I did it. And it was like, it was, it was kind of like the lighthouse, you know, you're out at sea and it's been a storm and you're trying to get back to shore and you need a guiding light. And the fact that she stayed clean, it's like, it's still there. It's still working. Just go there, follow that light. Right. You know? right. And so that's why I say like, just, just staying clean is a huge um, service to people in the program. You know, just, right. just be a living clean. example. Right. Yeah. And that, that was really, that was a really slippery slope that Denise, somebody who is a recovering addict does to help another addict who is, it is. active going through it because you could easily fall off and relapse. Mm-hmm. And then you guys are both in the hole together. Right. 
Um, but so it took it took a lot of courage to do that and also not relapse because that's the slippery slope. Now, um, you know, so when Annie, when you got clean, you hit me up to make your amends for all the suffering you caused. <laughs> All <laughs> for your addiction, and I was like, because you're working your steps, you know, it's one of the first steps is to make amends. Um, and I was like, okay, sure. Well, you didn't really suffer. I didn't really suffer or anything, but sure. <laughs> <laughs> check your, <laughs> check your um your list and go on to the next person. But um, instead of getting a new, because a lot of addicts have normal friends, friends who aren't addicts, friends who are full normies. And the difference between a normie and addict is the addict is is the one who's suffering far suffering from the addiction, um, and the normie is the one who can just like, you know, you know, everybody has normie friends. They can go and they can have a drink or two or three, and then just be done. And be like, I'm kind of tired. I want to go to sleep. I want to go do something else. They don't need to go back and keep going um, until the very end because there's no end for an addict besides the end of your life, and that's the difference between somebody who is prone to being and an addict, it's a chemical thing. So that's something that most people don't understand until they, they get into that situation. So um, instead of getting a new best friend, I also did NA with you guys. <laughs> so, and I love it. Cause I, and I coming in, coming in, not being an addict and going into the NA program, I always said um, in the birthday meetings, hi, I'm Vaughn. I'm not an addict, but I love NA okay. because of all of you. <laughs> And um, so I had nothing else to say, but I love hearing the stories of the recovery. And um, and I remember you and Denise, because I've been doing this with you guys for like 23 on years. But at, or at first it was like, Vaughn, why don't you go to Al-Anon? And it's for people like yourself who um, have family or friends who are in recover and it's a support system for people like yourself um because you're obviously not addicts so why why do na instead and i was like well no actually i i i prefer this one better i think it's more um insightful and i i i like that spiritual development so w- when you first do na as an addict one of the first things that you do is find a connection to your higher self so can you guys tell both of you guys tell me what is your definition of you know a connection to your higher self or God or whatever you want to you know, label it as? Because that's the first that's one of the first things in the steps. You go first. All right. <laughs> so, because everybody thinks it's all me, religion, so it, and it's not. Every single person um, in the program will tell no, you that. It's so. Not. so for me, I I use a general idea. So I, and this is how I describe it to, especially people that I know that are are religious, is that I don't think that I am all knowing to know whether or not the name of God is Buddha, God, Jesus, Allah. I, I don't think that I am the master of all and I know which one of those is right. But I know that there's a power greater than myself because I can see the evidence of him working in my life and of the um, way I feel, feel them inside of me. So to me, I call it God to keep it simple. But one of the things that is one of the program sayings is is God is good orderly direction. Mm -hmm. And I kind of just cling on to that. So for me, it's there there is evidence in my life that there's a power greater than myself because I wouldn't be here or be where I'm at today without it but um yeah that's that's really my sense of God and where I get my spirituality from um so I use a lot of the people and the program and nature and a, a combination of a bunch of different things that I see in other religions Mm -hmm. that kind of make up my higher power. Right, right. And so, Annie, what is, um, for you going to the program, what is your definition of um, how you see your your connection to your higher self or to God or whatever you want to call it? I smile when you say that because I'm looking at one of them, Vaughn. Oh, yeah. Hi, I see myself too. (laughs) Because to me, 
my higher power speaks to me through the people he puts in my life, beautiful, wonderful people like yourself, you know, through all those years of, of me coming in and out of battling my demons, you know, you would just randomly check on me. Like, are you alive? You know, mm-hmm. you know, are, are, are you okay? You know, you got to knock this shit off or, you know, let's just have lunch or whatever. And so, um, you know, and, and when you were talking about amends, you know, I had needed to make amends because, you know, I, I ditched our friendship for my drugs. You know, I left my friends behind to go get high. And so I, I needed to pay homage to that. And the thing is, is a lot of people I made amends to um, are still in my life. And that to me is evidence that there is a power greater than myself. I was not a good friend. I was a horrible friend. I was a horrible human being. <laughs> you know, and so, and you guys saw the good in me despite myself. And people like that show me that there is a power greater than myself. Um, I I say God, same thing, good orderly direction. Um, I think dogs are wonderful, and I don't think it's any coincidence that it's God backwards because there you go. <laughs> Um, you know, that's evidence to me. Things happen in my life often where I'm like this in all rational thinking, this should not, I should not be this blessed. If I got exactly what I deserved, I wouldn't be alive. So to me, that shows me that there's grace, there's mercy, there's love. And that is all power, more powerful than me, but most importantly, more powerful than my addiction. Right, so, right. I see evidence everywhere in my friends, in my family. Um, you know, it's, I'm blessed. I'm truly, truly blessed. Right, right. And they, I, I mean, I've heard so many stories from you about all the synchronicities and the ironic co- coincidences. No such thing, but yeah. That, exactly. <laughs> and when you get more spiritual and you get more into your spiritual journey, coincidence, coincidences or what people call synchronicities, um, become your every day all the time. It's almost like, oh yeah, of course that was going to happen because I asked for it. <laughs> or, I, I, I just thought about that. And of course, that's the, why, why would it not come into, into being? So that's a really good point that you make that it is the addiction that takes over is people's behavior. And when they get out of the addiction, then the real person is there. So um, because, you know, not to talk negatively about your ex fiance that you had this journey with. Um, Cause I knew, I knew him before you guys were both heavy in it and knew of him afterwards, still wonderful guy, mm-hmm. but the addiction took over your relationship and took over your behavior. And so it's like, it's literally like somebody who has a disease when they're going through the disease, they are not themselves. So you kind of have to, for everybody else in um, Al-Anon or the, the group, the support group, or people who um, love somebody who's going through that, you have to kind of make a distinction. And sometimes you have to take a huge step away so you don't get the blowback. Mm-hmm. So can you explain, because um, when people are going through their addiction problem and they're trying to go through recovery and trying to stay recovered, um, especially when they're high in on it, they can seriously burn some bridges with their loved ones. Can you explain um, how to deal with that for people who are, who have loved ones who are going through deep addiction right now? Good question. Um, because so that's, that's their journey too. It is. And they say that addiction is a family disease and it really is. It affects the whole family and family is not always just blood, you know, it's who you call family you know, um, so close friends, uh, colleagues, um, so on and so forth, it affects them. You know, about my ex, this is what I want to say is like some people who don't understand addiction would think, okay, he's clean now. He's got like 11 years clean. Um, And they say, oh, well, why didn't you guys, you know, you got clean. Why couldn't you just go back to where you were? The thing is, is um, you don't get to dance with the devil and not leave with a few scars. And so it changes you. When you are in the depth of that kind of addiction and dereliction and degradation, it changes you. And so when you come out of that, even, and I like to call him my war buddy, we were in war together and we survived it. And um, we had a happenstance of run into each other a few years back. I didn't 
really was not emotionally prepared for that, I'll be honest. Um, but I was actually filled with an overwhelming feeling of I wanted to hug him and say, I'm so glad you're alive. You survived. I sur we survived. And so um, because it really is going to war with your own demons. And so for people who are family members and loved ones of people who are in addiction, I know you're suffering as a direct result of their addiction. But the one thing you have to remember is nobody is suffering more than themselves, than that addict. They're in the middle of a fight for their life and they may or may not win. It, it depends on them, you know, and if they're ready and if they're ready in time. And the one thing I would say is they need to take care of themselves. They need to take care of themselves. And if that means you need to walk away, walk away. Sometimes explain I, that. Explain that. Because that is really hard to walk away from the people that you love who's going right. through an addiction is going to take everything from you because of their addiction. addiction. Stop bailing them out financially. Stop rescuing them physically. You need to walk away. If you, it, they call it tough love. Every time you bail them out from something that their addiction caused, you are helping to sign their death certificate. And you need to walk away. And I know that is way harder said than done. Um, but most what if of all, walking, you cannot let them take you down with them because then so you're really not there for them right. when they're ready. So right. the, the, the reality is, is like if you continue to bail them out of jail or give them money or give them a place to stay, then it stops them from hitting their bottom. And why is it so important for the loved ones? Because this is really hard. You know, you think... You know, you think when you love your somebody in your family or a really good friend and they're going through obviously a struggle with their addiction problem and they're an addict, obviously, and they're going through this disease. It's really hard to watch the people that you love suffer and suffer so hard and there's nothing that you can do. And so you just want to like what most people want to do is kind of cushion the blow so they will pay that person's rent. They make excuses for that person um, not paying the bills or going to work or going to school on time. They will cover for them, lots of covering for them. They will bail them out of jail. They will give them money. They will, you know, take out 401k to cover or mortgage the house to cover the, um, the, the holes in their child's finances or the sister or whoever's finances, they're going through these things. So they'll do all these things because they love and they want them to get better and they want to help them. But you're saying you two addicts are saying from going through this program for, I don't know what, 25 years now or something, um, maybe even longer. And then also seeing your parents and the community that's, that's recovered. Don't do that because you are helping sign their death, death certificate. That's really hard for a lot of people to it is. understand. Kind of to so the, it is, and, and not feel is, guilty about it. Right. right. It is really painful to watch somebody. So part of being in recovery for 25 years is not only having to stay clean, but I also have many people that I love that I've had to let go of mm -hmm. because I couldn't watch their addiction and I couldn't co-sign their bullshit. Mm -hmm. So um, really the thing is, and it, it is, it's really hard to do. So honestly, my advice is to cut them off completely um, and maybe come up with some way that you keep in contact with them once a month so that you can know that they're still alive and that you are there if they do decide it's time to get clean. Um, right, there right, is, right, a, right. like you were talking about before, mm -hmm. there's Al-Anon and Naranon mm -hmm. meetings. And, and that's what those are for. Those are not necessarily for the person who has an addict that's in recovery. It's for the person that has an addict that they are still using. Right, it's right. A real resource and people who are who have a loved one that's using, that's really where they need to go because enabling almost becomes an an addiction in itself. Ooh, and explain that one. Enabling somebody's addiction is an addiction to people pleasing and helping. If you I mean, imagine it like this, like your house is on fire, but there's a naked man streaking down the down the road. I'm going to go pay attention to that instead. So 
So you may not be coping so well with what's happening in your life as a direct result of someone's using. But if I put all my energy into fixing that person, I don't got to deal with me. I don't got to deal with how I feel. I'll just fix you. It becomes its own addiction. And the thing is, is the sooner an addict gets to their bottom, the sooner they can get help, the sooner they can get better. And if we prolong that process by enabling them, they might not actually ever get there before they die. Right, right. So fortunately, most addicts don't die from their addiction. But they might go homeless or they might uh you know get into a jail so, system or whatever no, they the, they do they do it's die. progressive a lot of will them happen um, yeah, yeah a lot of them do die they just might stay in a state of degradation for a really long time but eventually the disease is always progressive mm-hmm. eventually it will take their life and if you really think about somebody who's living homeless for a decade plus i mean is that really alive i mean if they're if they're out of their mind on drugs for for a decade, like they're not alive. Well, people not, that people don't alive. stay on the street for a decade and live. No. So most of the time when someone's on the streets, it is actually a good motivator for them to get off the streets. Yeah. That's that is such an interesting perspective that like if you have a loved one, family or friend who is going through um addiction let them ride it out don't help them the worst thing you're going to do is help them out don't help them um because you're enabling them and if it means they're going to go homeless let them go homeless if it means that they're going to hurt themselves let them hurt themselves because everybody's bottom's different and they have to get there that's basically There's, there's a man that comes to our meetings and um he's got like 34 years clean and he comes to the meeting often and um, he says, uh, um, he goes, I got, he goes, my, par- my family really, really loved me. They let me get homeless. Ah, oh, he says that in the hard. Meeting. Yeah. And it's, he goes, because they knew, they knew that if they kept helping me, I'd never be. So That's really they hard. Me, they let me get homeless. Yeah, yeah, see? Like, <laughs> the shades yeah. of love. The shades of love. That yeah. that takes a lot of love to love somebody so much to let them ride out their journey. And of course, they're not going to portray it to you when they're in the midst of their addiction and they're they're living their Oh yeah. Because they're, they're cussing say, you my out. My family hates me and they're horrible and this and that and they're going to be on homeless. Yeah. yeah gonna oh be- yeah. 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 And they're going to let me go homeless. They're going to let me lose this and that and blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. blah. Oh, that's hard, ladies. Now, you know, um, in the 23 years or so that I've been doing um, Narcotics Anonymous with you all, I've enjoyed watching people from all walks of life come in and out of the program to clean up their lives. And I have met quite a few prison inmates inmates who were just released and the program is the first place that they go. Now, most inmates are in prison for nonviolent crimes, but mostly they're there for doing drugs, okay, especially in the United States. Now, we still live in a prohibition society where we punish people for doing drugs as an escape to their problems. So we really need to address why people do the drugs in the first place, because you guys are both sh- describe that it's not necessarily for recreation fun it is a coping mechanism so we really need to see why are people doing drugs in the first place and your story and so many others will reinforce that aside from being like outliers of who are dangerous to our society um like ted kennedy and those are not ted kennedy but um you know the serial killer (laughs) no ted kennedy is not dangerous (laughs) Ted Bundy. Ted Bundy. Bundy. I'm telling you, I saw his truck one time by a river. (laughs) But anyways, but um, my killer. Yeah, (laughs) my spidey sense. My spidey sense. He's been in jail since you were like five. Yeah, you're thinking Green River Killer. Maybe the Green River Killer. Anyways, yeah. We we, we, yeah. So we live in Auburn, so this is this is the the thing. But anyways, um. (laughs) You know, these kinds of cases, they really need 
rehabilitation for drug addiction and healthy ways to cope with life struggles. So what are your thoughts for how we can, you know, take this and address the greater issue of why people use drugs to cope? Well, I want to say one thing first. Mm -hmm. You're right. Most people people are in jail for nonviolent offenses. I'm not going to say that they're in jail because they use drugs. They generally committed a crime to feed their addiction, robbery to get money to buy drugs. It's generally actually not because of drugs or they were dealing drugs generally to feed their addiction. But yes, the root cause was drugs. And so, um, yeah. But the root method is drugs. Right. The cause is the underlying condition that caused them to seek that method. Mm-hmm. Right. So, I mean, really, it, it's impossible to really know how to treat addiction before it becomes addiction. Exactly. I, I mean, it really, uh, for me, I would say it starts at home, Mm -hmm. but, you know, there are so many different, there's so many people that I know that grew up in, you know, non-divorced parents, a happy little white picket fence that still became addicts. So it's, you know, maybe some kind of a teaching because for the one consistent thing that I know about every addict that I think I've ever talked to is that they don't know how to deal with feelings. So it doesn't necessarily have to do that they grew up with addict or alcoholic parents or that they grew up in the ghetto or that they, you know, grew up in a lie or any of that. It's that they never knew how, what to do with how they felt. Mm -hmm. They never even knew how to identify how they felt or weren't allowed to express their feelings. So um, really, if we started teaching children how to cope healthy ways rather than, oh, you're sad, here, have some candy, or, you know, let me take you to ice cream or, you know, here you can sit in front of the computer or, you know, things like that. Just learning how to cope to actually process all your feelings and emotions and, and process through things because otherwise that, that's the one consistent thing I could say that I see in all the addicts that I know is that they never knew how to process their feelings. That's so true. I, yeah, I, I remember so many birthday part birthday meetings and um, NA conventions of you, with you two. And NA prom is my favorite. Um, <laughs> the, but uh, the women's retreat. But anyways, um, that is a consistent thing that even in the program, they're learning how to communicate and express the issues that they're dealing with, the feelings about things, um, the learning how to talk it out, um, and they're still learning how to do this. So um, you make a really good point, Denise, that a lot of parents are just basically putting pacifiers. Here's the candy, here's the iPad, here's the whatever, just to pacify so they can get on with the next thing that they need to do instead of address it. So they never really learn the building blocks of how to cope with their feelings, how to address challenges, how to work the steps in life to, you know, get from point A to B. Um, They never really got those building blocks. And so they just kind of grow and with, with um, a lack of the proper tools to function. And then they get older and they get into adult issues and we're adulting wrong. Um, And, we don't have the proper tools. So what do we do? We pacify it. And so for somebody who's an addict, they're just pacifying it with the drugs. Mm -hmm. So I would say the same thing is that it starts in the home and, 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 but there's always going to be those challenges for parents. I mean, as you know, Vaughn, and as I know, 
Some days it's everything we've got to, to get through the day and make sure that they ate and they took a bath and they did their homework and, and that we didn't fall apart. And, <laughs> and sometimes it's hard. So it's not only in the home. I truly believe it starts there, but then within our community. And we have this philosophy, you know, lock them up. They did, they did the crime, lock them up. But we don't have, it, it, I don't think our system is, is set up for this yet. They may be in time, but it's, why are you here? Like, how'd you get here? You had a drug addiction problem. Okay. Well, I mean, you are accountable for the crime you did. You still need to take, you still need to pay the piper, so to speak. But what can we do to help you get back on track so you don't have to keep committing these crimes? So you don't have to keep feeding an addiction. And because a lot of people that are addicts, you know, they have criminal records, but their criminal records really don't reflect them as a person. When you really get to know them when they're clean, it's not who they are. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times these crimes are committed because they're trying to feed an addiction. And so having an understanding of that and treating that versus the crime itself. The other part of that is an awareness that, hey, there is help available. There's always going to be broken homes. There's always going to be broken homes. Yeah. So having that information that there's places like Narcotics Anonymous and Alcoholics Anonymous and Naranon and Al-Anon, that these places are available, these resources are out there. I mean, I heard about Narcotics Anonymous because my dad had to go to treatment. But before that, my dad had never heard of Narcotics Anonymous. He'd heard mm-hmm. of Alcoholics Anonymous, but he didn't hear about it. But he, he wasn't a drinker. So that wasn't an option for him. Would he have maybe made different decisions if he would have known that a place like Narcotics Anonymous existed? Who knows? Who's to say? And so an awareness that there is another way. And I think the other part of it too is that whole spiritual connection and not a religious connection, but a spiritual connection. And it, I feel like in today's world, it's overlooked this, this uh, stop, slowing down and saying, what are we grateful for today? You know, tell me, tell me, child, what are you grateful for today? When they're having a tough time and and they feel like they're not as good as the other girls in class and telling them, you know, tell me what you like about yourself, teaching self-love and that kind of stuff. Um, and that whole spiritualness, it's not something that is taught in the home very often. That and is I so think- true. That is so true. Cause I come across a lot of, um, teenagers and children that I'll have full conversations with. And, you know, when I'm hanging out at the park with, um, my kids and they'll be there with their teenage brother or sister and I'll just have a normal conversation and we'll have full conversations and they would say this is the first time I ever talked to an adult for such a long time <laughs> <laughs> like adults wait where where, where is an adult I don't see one <laughs> oh yeah I'm the adult I have a kid oh yeah that's me now. all right I'm an adult all right so but 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 a lot of a lot of young adults do not have full-fledged normal conversations with their parents or with um, their elders. And a lot of children rarely will have full-fledged conversations with their parents about what they did, what was the challenge that day, what was the, the good thing that happened that day, and just kind of just have a normal conversation so you know what's going on. But um, because we're so busy with the rat race, we're so busy trying to do all these different things and packing all these activities in a day that we don't really have any more than maybe 10 minute conversation with your own kids. Mm -hmm. And so where are they going to learn those tools to address challenges with um, expressing themselves, overcoming um, obstacles, working on things, et cetera, et cetera. Where are they going to get these communication tools if their parents can't even do it with their kids while they're young? Mm-hmm. And then they grow up and there's fewer and fewer time to give those basic building blocks. So, um, you know, what tips do you guys have for people who um, are trying to give those building blocks to their kids so that when their kids become teenagers, if they were to be susceptible to um, a chemical ish- addiction to drugs, that they can maybe avoid it or um soften the blow um raise their bottom raise their bottom well it's it's really hard hard question yeah yeah, it's hard to answer that because for one i don't know how a normal person learns how to do those things (laughs) because i'm not a normal person and i didn't learn that way 
So the only way I knew how to learn how to process my feelings and find a higher power and learn how to do is through the program and through work in 12 steps. Well, normal people don't have that. From what I understand, you're kind of given that. I don't know somewhere in your brain, but <laughs> I never, I didn't know any of that. I didn't know how to do any of that. So it, it's impossible for me to, to tell you where to find it. I mean, there is books and stuff that they have out there that kind of use the same guiding principles. Um, I, the 12 steps came from the Bible. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> um, you know, there's, and I'm sure that in many different religions, there's different forms of that kind of healing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, you know, other than that, that, I don't understand. I don't know really any way that you could give that to your children other than just teaching them all together, you know, about self-love and, and, you know. The only thing I can think about is like when, um, like what would I wish I would have heard in my household growing up? Because I have the same problem. Like I'm coming at it from a lens point of a, rec a recovering addict with 18 years clean. Like I can't, I don't, I don't come at it from a normie's point of view. So all I can think of is what would be some things that may have helped me growing up. And one of the big ones is, is I wish in this society that mental health wellness <coughs> is not just a thing about that we talk about for people who are mentally ill, like mental health wellness <coughs> should be a thing. Like, is your child's mental health well, like meaning are they well-rounded? Do they think of themselves in a good light? Do they see the good in other people? Like pay attention to your kids's mental well-being not like do they have a mental illness but their mental well-being i did not have a good mental well-being i was consumed with like self-hatred because i was bullied and picked on and 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 made to feel less than so i wish that my parents would have paid better attention to my mental well-being and could have said to me you know like this this isn't going to be like this forever you are all going to grow up one day and you're going to love the fact that you're different and that you're beautiful how you are inside and out. You don't need to change for anybody. I accept you as you are. It's okay for you to feel not okay. Like that would have been a big thing because I often didn't feel okay. And that made me feel like something was wrong with me, like I was broken. And so we are so stuck on always having to be happy and having to be okay and and never being in a bad state of mind that we think that if we are, we have to fix that. We have to change that. Sometimes it's okay just to be in a shitty mood. And if your parents could just say, it's okay for you to be in a bad mood today. It's all right. It happens. I just think if parents paid more attention to their child's mental wellness, that can make a big difference. And if you as a parent are taking an active interest in your child's mental wellness, you might see those signs earlier. Really, really well said, ladies. Um, I think we've presented a lot of really good firsthand experiential knowledge about this subject that is going to help a lot of people who are struggling with this issue um, in their lives. And so for more information about Narcotics Anonymous or Alcoholics Anonymous, you can visit the website, which is na.org or aa.org. And if you have any other addiction issues, um, many of them follow the same pattern, you can go to their website as well, like Ga Gambling Anonymous and you know Sex Anonymous and so forth. So um, thank you kindly for listening to another enlightening conversation here at Merkaba Chakras. Until next time, blessing ladies. Love you, Bonnie. Bye. Bye. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Merkaba Chakras, where we talk Buddhism in the fifth dimension. For more information about today's guest, please go to the show description. For more information about Vaughn's metaphysical work, please go to MerkabaChakras.com. The views expressed today are for entertainment purposes 
and do not necessarily reflect the views of the host or replace any medical or legal advice. Don't forget to subscribe for more interviews about the fifth dimension. Until we meet again, blessings.